You are a Jedi, then? I'd have thought that was obvious. Not at all, Thrawn assured him. Our myths of the Republic speak of two groups of beings with such powers, the Jedi and the Sith. But the Sith are reputed to be clever and capable warriors. Welcome back to part three, The Complete Life of Thrawn. Picking up with Thrawn investigating the Clone Wars and his new ally, Anakin Skywalker, who had just moved to investigate a Separatist freighter. Skywalker and Thrawn rendered the droid guards of the freighter inoperative, uncovering its cargo of alcoholic beverages and gold ingots. Thrawn surmised that the vessel was delivering its goods to a Separatist manufacturing facility. Inside the crates, they discover unfamiliar symbols etched onto them. Through R2-D2's examination of the navigation computer, they learn that the Separatist ship was en route to the planet Surmau. Thrawn had previously installed listening devices in the cantina, and from them, they learned that five individuals had entered the establishment, incapacitated the bartender, and had taken him away. Upon returning to Black Spire and their land speeder, Anakin and Thrawn were attacked by a group of thugs. Despite being wounded, Thrawn drove their land speeder into the attackers, subduing them after some fierce combat. Through questioning their captured prisoners, including a cargo inspector named Oenti, they discovered that the bartender Janot had connections with a pro-separatist duke, Sola of Sereno, Count Dooku's home planet. From these prisoners, Thrawn and Anakin learned that Padme's handmaiden, Duja, had stumbled upon the smuggler's operation, which involved using Batuu to smuggle supplies to a separatist droid factory. Duja had managed to contact the Republic before her cover was blown, leading the smugglers to hastily try to ship their gains off-world, only to find that Padme's ship had already occupied the landing space. Wenty confirmed that Padme had landed at Black Spire and written a poem in honor of the late Duja. Jenna and Noenti denied involvement in Duja's death, and Anakin could sense that they were telling the truth. Thrawn revealed that they intended to head to the Separatist base on Mokiv, prompting Oenti and his accomplices to attack Thrawn and the Jedi. Anakin used his lightsaber to neutralize the assailants, except for Janet. Under duress, Janet revealed that Padme had survived and departed in a different ship. After leaving the bar, Skywalker briefed Thrawn on the complex political dynamics of the Clone Wars. When they arrived on Mokiv, Thrawn battled Duke Sola's droid forces alongside Anakin and Padme. The Separatists had a Cortosis mine and droid factory here, where they manufactured Cortosis B2 super battle droids to combat the Jedi Order. Cortosis possessed the unique ability to withstand energy weapons like blaster bolts and even lightsabers. Skywalker and Thrawn successfully located the droid factory, where Amidala aimed to infiltrate, and they eventually reunited with the Senator. Thrawn and Skywalker approached Duke Sola, pretending to offer the return of his lost cargo as a ruse to infiltrate the Separatist facility. Accompanied by an escort of B1 series battle droids and B2 series super battle droids, Sola led them into the factory's courtyard. While the Jedi General tried to create a diversionary attack on some of the droids, they were quickly captured and imprisoned within the facility. Calling on the Force and using telepathy, Skywalker communicated with his wife to initiate their rescue. Thrawn ingeniously fashioned a crude lockpick from the fibers of his clothing, which Anakin manipulated with the Force in order to free them from their cell. Padme arrived with local maintenance workers Huga, Simi, and Lebjow and helped them escape through unused parts of the factory. Thrawn, Anakin, and Padme retrieved Skywalker's lightsaber and were able to sabotage the factory on their way out. Thrawn briefly fell back, claiming to Amidala that securing the deflector shield generator had been his primary mission, but shortly after returned to assist the Jedi and his wife in defeating the Separatists. And after this victory, Skywalker and Amidala insisted on destroying the Confederacy's ability to produce Cortosis armored droids before departing Mokiv. Thrawn suggested sabotaging the droids to waste the Separatist resources on a flawed project, but Skywalker wanted to destroy the Cortosis mine itself. But this set off a chain reaction, causing a global catastrophe that left Mokiv barren and inhospitable. Shuri rejoined the group towards the mission's end, aiding the Chiss and Republic forces in defeating the Separatist Vulture droids guarding the base within both the atmosphere and in space. Thrawn admired Skywalker's bravery and ingenuity, and the Jedi spoke highly of Thrawn when reporting to Supreme Chancellor Sheev Palpatine upon his return to Coruscant. However, Thrawn expressed disappointment with the state of the Republic. He believed the democratic style of governance led to a bloated and stagnant system, where many voices were heard, but little was actually accomplished. Thrawn viewed the Republic's vast array of viewpoints and political ideologies as causing inefficiency and sluggishness. Despite this, rumors about the Chiss and Jedi working together spread among the people mining in the Thruki asteroid belt. 
In what was now five weeks after departing from Scylla, Thrawn and Cherie successfully returned to Chiss with the Republic Energy Shield. Upon his arrival, Thrawn held a meeting with Admiral Aralani and Supreme General Bakif to strategize for the upcoming confrontation against General Yiv and his Nicardun forces. The officers were well aware that the capture of a senior captain, especially by a faction not officially deemed as an enemy of the Ascendancy, would not be sufficient cause for a Chiss military response. However, the capture of a flag officer, or Skywalker, would indeed warrant military action. And with this knowledge, Thrawn and Erelani devised the plan to leverage this distinction to their favor. Thrawn decided to dispatch Skywalker Shuri and caregiver Thalius to Primea, using that VAC patrol boat he had acquired. Along with an apology and a warning to the VAC Combine, Thalius carried one copy of Thrawn's message, while a second and longer version was stored in the patrol boat's computer. The copy in the return ship included a cautionary note that Yiv might capture Thalius and Shuri and modify the message's contents to deceive the Vax. If the copies received by the Vax leader matched, the situation would remain calm, allowing time for consideration. However, these discrepancies would indicate Yiv's treachery and hopefully lead the Vax to oppose the Nicardun destiny. Thrawn aimed to put an end to Yiv's advance using the fabricated concept of Chiss family hostages. Shuri was officially aboard the VAC patrol boat due to her piloting skills, while Thalius assumed the role of the Chiss family hostage. Thrawn and Erolani intended for Yiv to capture the young Skywalker, to convince the Syndicure to authorize a military strike and end the Nicardun threat. Thrawn's warning to the VAC Combine included data he had gathered about other civilizations that Yiv had approached. Hoping to expose Yiv's promises and flattery as deception, concealing an iron-fisted rule, Furthermore, it extended an unauthorized invitation to the Vax Combine to form a military alliance with the Chiss Ascendancy. Dressed as Chiss family hostages, the two females were instructed to deliver their message directly to the highest ranking defense official in the Combine. Thrawn and Thalius expected that their message might be intercepted and replaced by an agent of the Yiv, but this detail was not disclosed to Sheri. And as anticipated, General Yiv captured Thalius and Shuri, taking them hostage, and sent a demand to Scylla that Thrawn deliver a monetary ransom aboard an unarmed freighter. The message specified coordinates for a high orbit of Primea and required Thrawn to come alone. Supreme Admiral Jafosk urgently called an emergency session at Scylla's Convocate Hall and delivered this news to an outraged Syndicure. While Syndic Thurfian had witnessed Thrawn's tendency to bend or exceed acceptable and legal boundaries for a Chiss officer, he was utterly unprepared for the revelation that Thrawn's actions had led to the capture of a Skywalker. These specialized Force users, whose very existence was a top secret within the Ascendancy itself, with them even using guild navigators in order to make the other aliens in the Chaos think that they were dependent upon the guild as well. At the threat that their Skywalker program could be exposed, Thurfian privately seethed at what he considered to be an act of treason against the Ascendancy. Summoned to testify before the Syndics, Thrawn lied that he had never intended to expose either woman to danger, asserting that Yiv's aggression was responsible for putting Thalius and Sherry at risk, not his own. Once Syndic inquired how Thrawn could have allowed a valuable Skywalker to fall into the hands of the enemy, and Jafosk responded by stating that the Nicardun destiny was not considered an official enemy of the Ascendancy. The Syndics and Jafosk deliberated on whether Yiv might be aware of the existence of a Chiss Skywalker Navigator program, ultimately concluding that there was no evidence to confirm or deny this. Despite the fury of the Syndics, they demanded decisive action to rescue Shuri, even if it necessitated a military strike, and thus an expedition to Primea was sanctioned. A representative from the Arizi family effectively concluded the meeting by stating that they had further questions for Thrawn and Erolani but which would wait until after the rescue of Shuri and Thalius. The plan was for Thrawn to proceed to Guild Concourse 447 and enlist the navigator to pilot his unarmed freighter to the specified coordinates provided by Yiv. Should Thrawn fail to retrieve Thalius and Shuri on his own, a Chiss fleet would promptly follow and reach Primea. However, in reality, Yiv had arranged for Quilori to be the navigator and lead Thrawn and his freighter to a location in the outer reaches of the Primea system. But Thrawn anticipated this, and would later use Yiv's treacherous act as justification for the Chiss fleet's pursuit to Primea. Having studied the schematics of Yiv's flagship, Battle Dreadnought the Deathless, which featured an excessively large viewport like other Nicardin vessels, 
Thrawn had the fleet make special modifications to the freighter he would use. This ensured that the freighter's nose would penetrate the viewport of the Deathless's bridge and create a perfect seal to the vacuum of space. Additionally, the fleet equipped the freighter with a prototype Republic Energy Shield, reverse engineered from the one obtained on Maquis, which surpassed the shielding technology commonly employed in the Unknown Regions at this time. But as required, the freighter had no weapons. Upon reaching the Premia system, Thrawn and Quilori spotted the Deathless accompanied by three other formidable Nicardoon battle dreadnoughts. Thrawn initiated communication with Yiv and announced his arrival and the possession of this specified monetary ransom. However, Yiv revealed that Thrawn had misinterpreted the situation. Instead, Thrawn himself was to serve as the ransom. The Nicardoon leader accused the Chiss officer of capturing one of his ships and killing the crew, and claimed that Thrawn had earned this death penalty. Yiv offered Thrawn the option of having his freighter shot down rather than being brought aboard and killed in person, but Thrawn declined. Acknowledging Yiv's cunning and arranging the meeting at a different location, Thrawn inquired whether other aspects of the meeting had been changed as well, to which Yiv amusingly responded before boasting about the Vax's unawareness of his significant military force within the system and nearby. Sensing the approaching Chiss cruisers, Thrawn raised the issue of revisiting the provision that he should come to Primea alone. At that moment, the Vigilant, Springhawk, and other Chiss cruisers emerged from hyperspace and promptly contacted the Primea Central Command to announce their arrival and inform the locals about the presence of Nicardoon warships. After conducting a sensor scan, the Chiss cruisers noted that the Nicardoon dreadnoughts had formed a blockade formation, confirming the assessment made by Mid-Captain Samarco and Sensor Officer Elod al Vumik, or Dalvu. The Chiss understood that the blockade was likely to prevent the Vax or anyone else in the system from stumbling upon Yiv's clandestine meeting with Thrawn, though the Vax were completely unaware of such a motive. Erolani transmitted the Nicardoon formation data to Primea Central Command, who interpreted it as a planetary blockade imposed by the Nicardoon destiny. Seeking permission, Erolani requested the Vax to allow the Chiss to clear out the blockading vessels from the system, and the Vax consented. Erlani's message also outlined the plan for the Vax to join the battle on the side of the Chiss if they chose to do so. As a result, the battle over Primea ensued, initially between the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet and the Nicardoon, but eventually drawing the Vax Combine to support the Chiss. Upon witnessing the arrival of the Chiss fleet at Primea, it became furious. Thrawn further provoked the general by highlighting his current dilemma. The Chiss fleet vastly outnumbered the Nicardoon patrol boats posing the blockade for Primea, and Yiv faced a difficult choice. Sacrificing his small warships would bring disgrace, as the Vax knew he had stronger battle dreadnoughts to reinforce the patrol boats. On the other hand, sending all his dreadnoughts to reinforce the blockade would make it seem like he was fleeing from Thrawn in his unarmed freighter. Additionally, if Yiv sent all three companion dreadnoughts to the Deathless to bolster his blockade, it would seem that he lacked the courage to join the battle himself. In his rage, Yiv eventually settled on a third option. He started torturing Thalius in an attempt to extract Thrawn's true plan, but Thrawn calmly and openly revealed his strategy to Yiv over the calm display. Thrawn aimed to trap Yiv in a predicament where the only way forward was to capture Thrawn's freighter using the Deathless's tractor beam and release Thalius and Cherie as initially agreed upon. Yiv arrogantly contemplated fulfilling Thrawn's wish, but also threatened to kill and dismember Cherie and Thalius before the Chiss senior captain. Meanwhile, Admiral Erolani instructed Mid-Captain Simacro, now commanding the Springhawk, to feign defeat and appealed to non-combatant Vac patrol boats for help. The Vax initially hesitated but eventually agreed to offer humanitarian aid, only to be ruthlessly attacked and destroyed by the Nicardoon warships. Now the Vac forces were fully committed to the battle, aligning themselves with the Chiss fleet and letting Erolani lead the plan. In mere minutes, the climactic battle quickly turned in favor for the Chiss. As Yiv's plans crumbled, Thrawn confronted him on the Deathless's bridge. At that moment, Sherry and Thalius discarded their hostage's disguise and released Tava Mist, impairing the reaction time of the Deathless's crew. Utilizing the Republic's shield generator technology installed on Thrawn's freighter, the ship withstood the Nekardun laser fire without significant damage. Accelerating, Thrawn's freighter crashed into the bridge of the Deathless, initially exposing it to the vacuum of space, before sealing it with that specially designed nose. Thrawn then rescued Cherie and Thalius, rendered Yiv unconscious with his blast of Tava Mist, and captured the general along with his data link reader and data banks. With his friends and prisoner, the Chiss trio then made their escape, and with the departure of Thrawn's freighter, the bridge of the Deathless was exposed to the vacuum of space, 
and went from unconscious to suffocating and dead. With the absence of their leader, the Nicardun destiny swiftly crumbled. Thrawn extracted a promise from Yiv's agent, the Pathfinder Quillori, to not disclose how Yiv was defeated and disband all of the Pathfinders under the Navigator's Guild if he broke his vow. However, it would be some time after this that a Grisk named Jixtis, a sworn enemy of the Chiss, would capture Quilori and threaten to leave him stranded on a derelict ship to die in some far off sector of space, torturing Quilori to reveal that Thrawn was the Chiss responsible for Yiv's downfall. And still seeking vengeance against the Chiss, Quilori would agree to ally with Jixtis. Meanwhile, on Scylla, the Syndicure was holding multiple meetings to address the Nicardun threat the discovery and subsequent defeat. Most Aristocra had superficial inquiries for the fleet officers, but Syndic Thurfian harbored a personal vendetta against Thrawn, extending to all of the officers of the Springhawk. After Yiv's capture and interrogation, the Syndicure concluded that the remnants of Yiv's forces needed to be eradicated, and consequently, they authorized the Nicardun campaigns. Jixtus had anticipated Yiv's failure against the Chiss Ascendancy, but still held to his plan that destroying the Ascendancy would pave the way for his easy conquest of the chaos. To achieve this, he plotted to incite a civil war among the Chiss, utilizing agents of the Grisk hegemony, including a member of the telepathic Agbui species named Haplif. This scheme unfolded simultaneously as the Chiss expansionary defense fleet was engaged in the Nicardun campaigns. By around 18 BBY, Thrawn embarked on a mission to the Vac Combine as a part of those campaigns, accompanied with Admiral Erolani and Senior Captain Zodlak and Daro, Lakinda of Picket 4-6. Thrawn led the Springhawk, while Erolani commanded the Vigilant and Lakinda the Greyshrike. Their primary objective was to eliminate the Nekardun forces within the Vac Combine, but Thrawn had also received a secret mission from Supreme General Bakif. During one of the battles, the Grey Shrike was disabled, prompting Erolani to order Thrawn to protect the damaged cruiser and then aid the Vigilant in eliminating the remaining Nicardun enemies. After their defeat, Ngali Formoroxa, whom Thrawn had met earlier, invited the Springhawk and its crew to the Rapex system to mediate a dispute. As a result, the picket force split up, and Thrawn's Springhawk was assigned to the new mission on Rapak. Meanwhile, Syndic Zestalmu and Thurfian, who is now the Syndic Prime of the myth, plotted to draw Thrawn far away from Chiss territory by spreading rumors of an alliance between the Patatus and Vagari pirates. They hoped that Thrawn, famous for his past victories against both enemies, would take the bait and leave Ascendancy space. The Syndics also believed that Thrawn's prowess in acquiring valuable alien technology, like the gravity well generator from the Vagari, could be advantageous to the nine ruling families. Unbeknownst to them, these rumors were intentionally leaked to Chiss intelligence, being created by the Grisk Jixtus. Once they entered the Repak system, the Springhawk encountered the Nicardun blockade frigate, which had been seized by the Pakian governance. Thrawn communicated with the frigate's captain in the Tarja trade language, assuring him of the Chiss ascendancy's peaceful intentions. To prove his Chiss identity, Thrawn accepted Ungali's challenge to disable a shuttle harmlessly, showcasing the Chiss' ability to incapacitate enemies without causing lasting harm. Recognizing each other as old friends, Thrawn returned Ungali's Maroxa sub-clan ring bearing that image of the Chimera, which further solidified their alliance. Ungali took Thrawn, Thalius, and Simacro into Rapak's capital city, Baropak, which had suffered significant damage due to the Nicardun's withdrawal and the Pakasha's eagerness to eliminate this enemy. Ungali revealed that his true purpose for inviting Thrawn was to resolve a dispute involving 200 refugees of a mysterious species led by a figure known as the Maggies. These refugees were planning to kill themselves in order to join the Beyond, due to their belief that all members of their species had perished in a civil war on their homeworld. This caused tensions between the refugees and their Pakash hosts, leading Uangali to request Thrawn, Thalius, and the Springhawk's help. Recalling what he had learned about the previous shuttle of slaughtered refugees, Thalius' presence, being a woman, was seen as crucial to persuading the Maggies to reconsider this suicidal order. Thrawn and his companions visited the refugees in a convocation hall within an abandoned school building, where Thalius spoke with the Maggies, successfully convincing their leader to visit their homeworld to confirm the fate of her species before making any irreversible decisions. Despite all the translation issues, the Chiss crew devised a plan to maintain the illusion of Thalius's high rank and navigate through this time-sensitive situation with the Maggies. 
So Ron decided to head straight to the refugees' homeworld rather than sending updates to Scylla first. Trusting in Thalius' judgment and his own ability to think on the fly, they prepared to face the unknown of the Magus' homeworld. This quest would take them far beyond Chiss territory, all while the Grisk species' aggressive plot against the Chiss ascendancy was unfolding. Upon reaching the Maggie's homeworld, Thrawn inquired about its name, but they refused to share that information with an outsider. In response, Thrawn symbolically named the planet Sunrise, reflecting his hope for a brighter future for these people. The Springhawk made an in-system jump to position itself 40,000 kilometers above Sunrise's equator. Soon after the jump, the Springhawk faced an attack by unknown forces, which would prove to be affiliated with the Grisk hegemony. Fifteen missile boats engaged in a coordinated assault, but the Chiss heavy cruisers managed to defend themselves. A Battle Dreadnought class warship also appeared in the battle. Unfortunately, Lakinda's Grey Shrike joined the battle, aiding in driving back the Dreadnought and ultimately forcing its retreat. The Dreadnought guarded a small freighter-sized vessel that Thrawn, Simacro, and Lakinda hoped would uncover clues about their attackers and this civil war on Sunrise. Later discovered to be the Hope Breaker, a Shatter-class Warmaster of the Gris Hegemony, the Dreadnought destroyed ten of its own missile boats to prevent the Chiss from examining them. After witnessing the devastation on their homeworld, the Magus gave her command for the companions to commit suicide and attempted to do the same herself. However, Thrawn intervened and detained her for causing the alien's death on his vessel, placing her in a hibernation chamber within Cherie and Thalius' Skywalker suite. Thrawn received a transmission from Supreme Admiral Jafosk, summoning him back to Scylla for further orders and debriefing. Returning from Sunrise, Thrawn piloted the Springhawk back to Scylla, where he and Simacro attempted multiple meetings. First, they debriefed the full Defense Hierarchy Council on the skirmish above Sunrise. Then, they faced inquiries from a select committee of the Syndicure regarding their mission. Lastly, they had an off-the-record meeting with Bakif, during which the Supreme General shared concerns about allegations of the alliance between the Patatus and Vigari pirates. Thrawn found the notion of such an alliance implausible, given their previous devastating defeat against Picket Force 6. But despite Bakif's skepticism, he tasked the Springhawk with investigating the rumors, as both the Syndicure and Council agreed on this goal. Simacro suspected ulterior motives from the ruling families, suggesting they might be seeing profits by sending Thrawn against the Vagari once again, referring to the valuable technology Thrawn had acquired from lesser space in previous encounters. While Bakif did not confirm or deny this, his lack of reaction confirmed Simacro's suspicions. Once he was assigned this mission, Thrawn designed a search pattern and shared it with Bakif, Erolani, and Lakinda, allowing them to locate him if necessary. Before departing, Thrawn inquired about the fate of Greyshrike, and whether it would return to investigate Sunrise and the attackers. Bakif did not explicitly confirm its return, but hinted that the cruiser, along with Erolani's Vigilant, would be assigned a follow-up mission. The Grey Shrike would later receive orders to aid in Thrawn's search for the pirates, but Thrawn would be too far away to acknowledge this information at the time. To investigate the allegations of the alliance between the Patatus and Vigari pirates, his first stop was the Patatus homeworld of Netehi, which had been conquered and subdued by the Nicardoon. Upon entering the system, the Springhawk conducted scans of 20 Patatus fighters, 6 enhanced cruisers, and 1 heavy frigate orbiting the homeworld, and they seemed to be engaged in a combat exercise. Soon after, a transmission was received from the Patatus, identifying himself as Prince Militaire, accusing the Chiss of trespassing in their sacred space. Thrawn and Simacro deduced that Prince Militaire likely held a dual role as a civilian and military official in the Patatus government. They noted that this alien was unusually talkative compared to all previous encounters with the Chiss, and he introduced himself as Senior Captain Thrawn, piloting the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet's warship Springhawk, expressing peaceful intentions, and said that they had a question for the Prince, but without saying what that question was, hoping to observe his reaction and learn more about their tactical situation. Before they got a response, the Patatus vessel shifted into a defensive formation, and Simacro concluded that the Prince Militaire was aboard the frigate. Thrawn pointed out the atypical repositioning of the cruisers, suspecting Nicardoon forces were present on one of them, monitoring the conversation and threatening the prince's frigate if he sought Chiss assistance with the Nicardoon. Thrawn reiterated their peaceful intentions, but warned of the Chiss ascendancy's formidable power if the Patatus' situation remained unchanged. The prince reacted aggressively towards the Chiss, prompting a skirmish that ultimately resulted in them siding with the Chiss to liberate the homeworld against the Nicardoon. 
To demonstrate their unity, the Springhawk and Pathetus engaged in a coordinated light show, firing spectrum lasers at each other with minimal impact, intended only to neutralize the Nicardoon controlled frigate. Grateful for the assistance in reclaiming their homeworld, the Pathetus asked what was Thrawn's question, and allowed the Springhawk to utilize their long-range communications to reach the Ascendancy. Thrawn inquired about recent Vagari pirate activity, but the Pathetus claimed they had no leads. Armed with this information on the presence of Nick Ardoon and absence of Vakari forces, Thrawn updated his search pattern and sent a revised plan to Naporar. He employed their triad to transmit the message in Chiss language, Cheyun, over to the Syndicure and Defense Hierarchy Council. To ensure the message's authenticity, Thrawn used his personal encryption key, which convinced Bakif and the others, ruling out any Patatis deception. Following the liberation of Natehi, Batidus and Chiss fostered significantly improved diplomatic relations, despite all their previous hostility. Following the departure from Natehi, Thrawn continued his search pattern in pursuit of rumored remnants of the Vagari pirates. Eventually, Springhawk encountered a Wraith captain named Fsir, who claimed his freighter Salt Barrel was being pursued by these pirates. It was revealed that these three attacking Wraith gunboats were remotely controlled and did no real damage to the Salt Barrel. Thrawn told caregiver Thalius and mid-captain Simacro that the gunboat pilots must have had extremely poor aim if they were actually trying to harm the freighter. The Springhawk engaged and destroyed all three gunboats. The seer informed the Chiss that he knew the location of the supposed Vagari pirate base from which these gunboats had been launched. However, instead of simply providing the system's coordinates, the Wadith captain insisted on leading the Springhawk there personally. Thrawn was skeptical of Fasir's motives and claims, and he insisted on thoroughly examining the debris from the destroyed gunboats, and boarding the salt barrel to assess the Watith's crew. Despite all of Fasir's objections, Thrawn reassured the Watith that the Chiss couldn't understand their writing system, allowed them to hide their computer systems. He framed this boarding as payment for saving their crew and cargo. Eventually this convinced him, and upon boarding the salt barrel with Chiss guards, Thrawn noted the crew's count and presence of 20 consoles, which he believed were used for remote piloting. He suspected that this was all a trap, but still decided to escort them to the supposed Vagari base. He saw it as an opportunity to assess a potential new enemy and how bold they might be in attacking a Chiss warship deliberately, which should be technically allowed as an evaluation of threats beyond Chiss borders. The journey to the alleged Vagari base required short hyperspace jumps, recalibrations, and coordination with the Grey Shrike, which was able to meet up with them for this hunt. As they reached the last system before the alleged Vagari base, Mid Captain Apros of the Grey Shrike successfully made contact with the Springhawk. Thrawn provided Apros with their status and coordinated a plan for both ships to lie in wait in the shadow of the planet. Upon reaching the designated system, the Springhawk and Salt Barrel were confronted by a fleet of 20 gunboats that swiftly attacked them. Seer believed that two of the gunboats were headed to a Vagari base to call for reinforcements, while he claimed the base itself was an orbital weapons platform. Thrawn realized that to reach the fleeing fighters, they would have to deal with the remaining 18 gunboats first. Senior Captain Kareel chuckled, and Thrawn devised a unique plan. He ordered weapons officer Afriu to target the two closest gunbolts with the Springhawk Spectrum lasers, while Kirill prepared a full spread of ionizing plasma spheres for the rest. Skywalker Sharif found these orders irregular, as it typically took a combination of weapons to destroy enemy ships. But somehow the leading gunboats were swiftly destroyed by the lasers, obscuring the view of the remaining gunboats. But the others evaded the plasma spheres with uncanny speed faster than an organic could survive, proving they were being piloted remotely. Eventually, two gunboats were disabled but intact, leaving 14 operational gunboats on the plane of battle. Thrawn's officers were now convinced of the Watith's culpability, and he ordered Lachnim to fire plasma spheres to disable the salt barrel. At the same time, Thrawn signaled the Grey Shrike to reveal its presence. Mid-Captain Apros warned the unidentified gunboats to stand down, and the salt barrel's evasion attempts failed. The ionizing energy from the plasma spheres disabled the freighter and cut off control to all remaining gunboats, including those two heading for the planet. Thrawn commanded the crews of the Springhawk and Grey Shrike to secure the disabled ships and arrest the Watith crew. The prisoner admitted that they were hired to distract Thrawn from the internal events in the Ascendancy. Their employer was later revealed to be the Grisk hegemony agent Jixtus. Although the Chiss celebrated their victory, Thrawn cautioned his officers that the day might not be over yet. He inquired if the Watith's claims of the orbital Vagari pirate base in the planetary shadow was true, but Apros confirmed that there was no such base. 
Relieved, Thrawn declared the day over, only to be interrupted by Apros raising an urgent matter. He invited him aboard the Spring Hawk while the Grey Shrike's personnel were gathering up the disabled gunboats. Apros relayed unsettling news to Thrawn and Simacro that Senior Captain Lakinda, the commanding officer of the Grey Shrike, had left her post in response to a Zodlak family emergency summons on the planet Kelwis in the southeast of the Ascendancy. Thrawn was deeply concerned about this as Lakinda was known for her unwavering dedication. Apros had no further details about the circumstances and said that he tried to dissuade Lakinda from leaving, but to no avail. She was accompanied by a Zodlak hyperdrive technician named Lakurn on the trip to Kulis. The situation raised suspicions as whoever issued the Zodlak emergency summons had called for all military personnel in the family to gather, regardless of their rank or position. Apros also revealed that the emergency summons had been issued to members of two other great families, the Aragal, who were called the Copero, and the Pomrio, who were summoned to Sarvchi, both worlds also being in the southeastern region. Thrawn was determined to help resolve whatever trouble was brewing, even though the EDF had not been formally invited. The Chiss heavy cruisers, including the Springhawk and Grey Shrike, were able to collect the 14 gunboats and the salt barrel. And Apro shared his reason for visiting the Springhawk in person, handing Thrawn a Nyx brooch, explaining that it had caused much official interest on Kelwis. A Zodlak rancher there had acquired one, sent it to his cousin Lakbulbup on Naporar, who then sent it to Thrawn through Lakworm. However, due to the family emergency on Kelwis, Lakinda tasked Aproach with giving it to Thrawn. Once Aproach returned to the Grey Shrike, Simacra revealed that the three great families named were all allied with rival ruling families. This added to the tension and discord in the Ascendancy, given the already heightened animosity between the ruling families. Despite Simacro's skepticism, Thrawn knew something about this brooch would be valuable in understanding the situation. Attached to the brooch was a note stating that it came from Agby, who identified themselves as cultural nomads. Thrawn carefully inserted the note into his Questus, a mobile computer device, and was able to gather information about the item's history. He noticed artistic resemblances between the brooch's metal threads and the clothing of the Magis, who was still imprisoned in the hibernation chamber on the Springhawk. Thrawn decided to wake the Magis to inquire about the brooch and was accompanied by Simacro as they entered Thalius and Cherie's suite, making sure the Skywalker was still asleep. They informed Thalius about the brooch and the family emergencies, and she suggested that the Agui might be related to the Magis people, but Thrawn dismissed a genetic relation, though agreed there was a cultural one. Their prisoner was angry with Thrawn, accusing him of betraying her people and denying her rightful leadership. She believed her people were gone and had no right to survive. Thrawn attempted to reason with her, but her resolve was firm, claiming she and her people must die to reach the beyond. When Thalias showed her the brooch, the Magus' demeanor changed. She recognized it as a product of her homeworld, crafted by artisans of the Southern Mountain, and believing a pocket of her people must still be alive somewhere, she demanded that Thrawn take her to Sunrise immediately. They explained they needed to wait a little longer to avoid unwanted attention. If her survival became known to others on the ship, it would delay her reunion and agreeing with this reasoning, she accepted being put back into stasis. And Thrawn said that their next move was to seek out Senior Captain Lakinda. Thrawn, Simacro, and Apros were able to get in touch with her during a repositioning stop on her journey home. They told her about the gathering of the Pomrio and Aragal families and the suspicion that the Agbi might be involved in this plot. Apros specifically asked Lakinda if her mission had anything to do with alien jewelry and she revealed that she was in charge of the Zodlak frigate Midsummer and the light cruiser Apogee. On a mission to claim the supposed Agbi mining world of Hoxim, Agbi had deceived them into believing they possessed an abundance of Nyx, setting up a fake mining settlement to convince the Zodlak officials of their riches. Kinda realized that the Agbi's plan was to incite a Chiss civil war among the three great families, who would fight over the ownership of a world which was in reality just a worthless rock. Thrawn acknowledged the cleverness of this scheme and proposed a plan to defuse the situation. The Springhawk, Greyshrike, and Lakinda's ships would create a fake attack scenario, with the family fleets forming an alliance to destroy the unknown gunboats attacking Thrawn's cruiser. This plan would prevent the families from engaging each other in battle and earn them praise and accolades. So Macro and Lakinda initially thought this plan was insane, but they couldn't come up with a better solution and prioritized preventing a Chiss civil war even if this meant sacrificing her ships. Thrawn assured her that they would do everything possible to avoid such a sacrifice. Thrawn's Springhawk and Apro's Greyshrike arrived at Hoxim well ahead of the Zodlak, Pomrio, and Aragal family task forces. 
The Springhawk was positioned on the far side of the planet, where it would appear to be under attack by 14 Watith gunboats. The cruiser's systems were manipulated to create an illusion of distress, with flickering lights and intermittent thrusters. Thrawn's plan was to use the arrival of the family's task forces to rescue the Springhawk from this apparent alien attack, forming an alliance between the families and preventing them from engaging in battle, unified against this alien threat. Fourteen Chiss officers and warriors from the Zodlak, Pomrio, and Aragal families were selected to remotely operate the captured Watith gunboats from those consoles aboard the Salt Barrel. These individuals were chosen because of their familiarity with the layout and operations of their respective family fleets. During the journey, some macro supervised combat training simulations aboard the Salt Barrel to prepare for the gunboat operations. On one of them, Lagnum expressed concerns about firing upon vessels of his own family. Samacro assured him that Thrawn's plan was strictly military and not politically motivated. As the Great Family's task force arrived on Hoxim, the Springhawk appeared derelict and imperiled. Senior Captain Lakinda managed to persuade the families to form a united front to defend their fellow Chiss. Thrawn then gave the order for the gunboat operators to put on a convincing performance, tacking with full force while inflicting minimal damage. The plan relied on the family's desire to secure the supposed Nyx mine, leading them to stay and fight a stronger force rather than retreating and regrouping. Controlled from the salt barrel, the gunboats strategically targeted non-critical systems on the family ships, minimizing damage while still maintaining the appearance of a fierce attack. However, as the battle progressed, the family task forces destroyed six of the gunboats, leaving only eight remaining. Lakinda noticed a potential flaw in Thrawn's plan, that as this battle dragged on and saw that it was actually devoid of valuable minerals, seeing that they'd all been deceived, tensions would rise and they might start to fight each other. Lakinda managed to send a warning to Thrawn about the impending problem before her own officers mutinied and confined her in her quarters. Meanwhile, aboard the salt barrel, the gunboat operators contemplated the sacrifice needed to crash the freighter into the fake Agbuy mine. Lacknim volunteered for the dangerous task, but Thrawn intervened, insisting that the freighter must appear to be piloted, and instead asked Lacknim to save him a gunboat for personal use, and prepare to evacuate the Springhawk. In reaction to Lakinda's warning, Thrawn summoned caregiver Thalius and Skywalker Shuri to the bridge. The Springhawk then signaled the Grey Shrike to make its appearance, causing the remaining gunboats to flee. The Grey Shrike destroyed three of the fleeing gunboats, leaving two intact, and while the salt barrel was evacuated and released, Thrawn ordered specific near misses on the freighter to create the appearance of a restored but malfunctioning Springhawk. Using Cherie's force connection and precognition, they planned to collide the salt barrel and two gunboats into the fake Agby mine and convincingly destroy it. With the battle being recorded, they only had one chance to make it appear authentic. They couldn't reveal that they were controlling everything via tractor beam. Thrawn reminded his bridge crew that the rival families were recording this battle, and this required a very subtle understanding of Third Sight. Thalius warned Thrawn that Cherie couldn't use her precognition to try and change the future in this manner, but Thrawn believed it could work as long as it was after remaining in the controls, manipulating the ships with the tractor beam, and having Cherie relay where she was seeing them crashing in the future, and having the tractor beam operator adjust, collapsing these potential future visions until they finally had the right collision course. Thalius only agreed, hoping that this would prevent a Chiss civil war. And though Cherie's mind and body were heavily taxed by this, she appreciated how much Thrawn trusted her. And after this clash above Hoxim, Supreme General Bakif was doubtful about the official account. Though all of these forces, from the Zodlak, Pomrio, and Erangal, to the individual crews of the Grey Shrike and Springhawk, that the Springhawk was attacked, disabled, and boarded by unknown aliens, the Grey Shrike and Family Task Force arrived just in time to save Thrawn's cruiser, and the intruders were found dead in the Springhawk's brig. According to their testimony, the boarding party had been implanted with small doomsday devices by an unidentified employer. An enemy freighter attempted to flee, but collided with the last two surviving gunboats, resulting in its crash and falling down into a fiery explosion on the planet below. The three families praised Mid-Captain Apros for his heroicism, and they all emphasized their Chiss identity above family allegiances. But there was still the mystery of why these three family defense ships were so far from the Chiss Ascendancy's territory. But Keith further pushed to learn the truth, but Samacro cited secrecy protocols involving Chiss Skywalkers, meaning Cherie could not be interrogated, and as a result he couldn't disclose all the details to the General. Only Senior Captain Thrawn had the authority to release the Seal of Secrecy, and Bakif doubted he would get the complete truth. All attempts to inquire further were obstructed by the ruling families allied with the Great Families, who had their own dislike for Thrawn's Myth family. 
Even as Bakith pushed further, Samakro's lips were sealed, though he did criticize Thrawn's personality while still acknowledging his excellent leadership and strategy. Bakith swore to investigate the Hoxham skirmish further, and the involvement of the Expansionary Defense Fleet allowed the Defense Hierarchy Council to investigate the Agbi and their Nyx jewelry, despite all of the family's resistance. And it was shortly after this skirmish that Patriarch Thuraki passed away. The beloved leader who helped both Thrawn and Thras was gone, and now Syndic Prime Thurfian succeeded him with the new myth Patriarch continuing his plotting against Senior Captain Thrawn. Let's call it here for part 3. In part 4, the Grisk threat will come to a head, and Thrawn will be pushed further and further out of Chiss space, entering the orbits of Sith Lords and the leader of the Empire. Please hit that like button, subscribe so you don't miss anything, leave a comment and share the video, but most important of all, remember, Force powers combined with Thrawn tactics are the most powerful combos in the galaxy, and the Force will be with you, always.